lime, Louise Kimmel lime cooler, I guess you would say. So that they were, they were both born in Baltimore, and uh, raised there, and so was I. So uh, it, the the family had been there for oh for a very long time. Okay. Were there any other, in addition to your brother, do you have any other siblings? Yes, I do. Oh, okay. Two older brothers. Okay. Uh, uh, Joseph and Urban, and then two younger sisters. Okay. Uh, Mary Louise and uh, Rosemary. Okay. <clears throat> and so. Let's talk a little about your early years and then go on to high school. That'll be kind of good. What you? Okay. I I went to. Uh, uh, do you, you want to you start at high school? or you know, Your early years, where did you go to grade school? Close oh, I went to grade school at a local Catholic school. Okay. Blessed Sacrament School. Mm -hmm. And then I went to uh, <clears throat> a central uh, Catholic high school it's called Calvert Hall College, actually. Mm -hmm. It's a very old uh, Christian brother school in uh, downtown Baltimore. <clears throat> and then I went to uh, Loyola College, a Jesuit college in Baltimore. Okay. which is now called Loyola University of the East. Okay. And from there, I went to Johns Hopkins. Let's, so let's I, I first got a bachelor's that, uh, degree Ford, in chemistry. Let's back up. Tell us a little about college, what your major was and, and uh, your okay. course of study. Tell us a little about that. Okay. All right. Uh, at, at college, I uh, took chemistry and got a bachelor of science degree at Loyola in chemistry. And <clears throat> when I graduated, I had learned about a... Uh, uh, a special program at Johns Hopkins where I could go in, in two years and get an engineering degree. And so I, I applied for that and I won a scholarship. I was going to take chemical engineering and uh, as I was registering I got talking to the Dean of Engineering who through our conversations I switched to industrial engineering. Okay. <laughs> it just started a program there and the Dean was actually the head of the program. Okay. Well, good. And so I, that, that's how I got into industrial engineering. Okay. Did you and live so on? Two, did you live on campus? No, actually, okay. I lived at home because I was really within walking distance of both Hopkins and Loyola. Oh, okay. All right. And so, uh, <clears throat> and so when I graduated from, let's see, I graduated from Loyola in 1950 uh -huh. in chemistry, and then from Hopkins in 1952 with a bachelor of engineering science in industrial engineering. And then I went to work for uh, <clears throat> DuPont Corporation in Wilmington, Delaware, in their central engineering department as a uh, junior consulting engineer for the corporation. And <clears throat> But uh, within, uh, let's see, I guess within about four months, I got drafted into the Korean War. Okay. <laughs> and left, <laughs> left Purdue. I left DuPont and uh, went into the Army for two years. Uh, as a, as a, uh, actually, I was stationed uh, very close to home again at Aberdeen Proving Grounds, uh, testing uh, anti-aircraft equipment, mm -hmm. and I was stationed there for two years. And okay. then, at the end of those two years, I went back to work at uh, at Dupont. Okay, all right. And, uh, <clears throat> I, so let's see. I went back to Dupont in 1954. Okay, and. Uh, at, at DuPont until 1957 and in 1957 I through conversations with Dean Roy at Hopkins I decided to go back and get my doctor's degree at uh, Hopkins mm -hmm. and so I went to Hopkins and I was there uh, from 57 to 61 um, working on my doctorate at at Hopkins okay and <clears throat> my uh, thesis was in the transportation, the safe transportation of radioactive materials. And actually the thesis got published by John Hopkins Press as a book. Okay. Uh, Very nice. Yeah, it was really quite good. Uh -huh. And so I was there until 61 and that's when I came to Purdue. How did the, uh, uh, how did the, how did you get to Purdue? Would they, would they recruit you or? Yeah, actually, I, I think I think really how it how it happened. Now that I look back afterwards, uh, at the time I wasn't quite aware of all this. But mm -hmm. <clears throat> Dean Roy, who was uh, my mentor at at Hopkins, was also a close friend of Harold Amrine, who was the head of the program at Purdue. And Harold and uh, and Dean Roy had been associated through the Institute of Industrial Engineers, and very active in 
writing the new definition for industrial engineering and getting the the national programs underway. Mm -hmm. And so I think Dean Roy had talked to Harold Amrine, and Harold Amrine had invited me to come to Purdue for an interview. Uh -huh. And I'd gone to some other schools, uh, but went to Purdue, and I don't know, it, was, it just was sort of a, I guess, a love at first sight. Somehow sure. I knew, <laughs> kind of when I visited and when I left, that this was probably going to be the best place uh, for my family and for myself. Good, okay. So now you're at Purdue. Talk a little bit about when you, and you came as an associate professor. Yeah, actually I was offered an associate professorship based on my uh, uh, experience at, at DuPont, which, which surprised me. <clears throat> and I remember uh, another person who I think was quite influential was, was George Hawkins. Okay. Because George was the dean of engineering at the time. Okay. And he, uh, he was extremely friendly and uh, he also was a good friend of Rob Roy's, uh, okay. Dean Roy at Hopkins. So I guess I get the feeling now that those three might have been talking about this without <laughs> my knowing about it. Anyway, it was a very, uh, a very agreeable arrangement. And where, uh, so then, uh, where did you live when you first came here? Was yeah, was well, the I, campus I lived, like you know, university has uh, rents rents uh, properties to new faculty. Okay, and I lived down there and. Right along near the river on Catherwood Court, which is right down uh, near North River North Road. River Road, yeah. Sure. Okay. All righty. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about your teaching, and also I'd like you to. You uh, originally you did a lot of research in that operations research in the library with. Um, That's right. <clears throat> when when I came uh, uh, to Purdue and, and became active, uh, the the person I really replaced on the faculty for teaching purposes was a fellow named Paul Randolph, okay, who was on the faculty but switched to. Uh, statistics and mathematics. He changed from IE to mathematics and he left open uh, the courses he was teaching, I took over and taught mm -hmm. okay. and, uh, <clears throat> in, uh, in operations research. And uh, Paul at the same time had made an initial uh, investigation about doing operations research in libraries and he got me involved in it. Uh -huh. And so he and I uh, talked to uh, the dean of, uh, well, the dean of the libraries uh, John Moriarty. Uh, yes, sir, right. Uh, John Moriarty. And he was very enthusiastic, Moriarty. And uh, <clears throat> so Paul kind of dropped out, and I took uh, up and made the application to National Science Foundation, wrote the program, and started the program. Uh, actually, we started it first within the library, and then we got support from National Science Foundation to do the work. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it was a very, it was a very good... Uh, the initial program we started was very good, I thought, because what I did, I got my students involved mm -hmm. in, in it, and I used it really as a laboratory. Uh, the library was kind of a laboratory for my graduate students. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what we did, we would meet. Uh, we got so we would meet uh, regularly. I think it was like once a week with the, with the library staff, and discuss the projects what new projects to work on and the progress being made on various projects. And each student would uh, select something <coughs> to work on within the library, uh, uh, an operational problem of some kind. Mm -hmm. And we would then have these reports and they would write it up as a thesis or as a, a, a class report, however they were doing it. In some cases, PhD dissertation. Mm, very good. So it became quite a big group of students and uh, and many of the staff would come, and Jack would come, Jack Moriarty would come every week and uh, join in enthusiastically in the discussion. Sure. So having his support was very, very good. Right, exactly. And so we, we <laughs> got, got a lot, lot of publications of out of that, too, didn't we you? We did. We got a lot of uh, theses, a lot of master's theses uh, sure. and doctor's dissertations and, uh, and papers that were written. Yes, right. it's true. It was true. It was quite a successful program, yeah. I think. Right. Okay. Well, let's move on now. You became the head in 1969. That's right. Okay. In, in 1968, actually, I took a sabbatical leave. Oh, that's and, when you uh, went to... <clears throat> and went to oh, Berkeley. Okay. And in fact, uh, the reason I was invited to Berkeley was because of the research in libraries. Oh, okay. So, uh, my, my visiting at, at Berkeley was jointly with the IE department, but mostly with the library uh -huh. and uh, the library school. And I became very uh, a teaching at the library school, 
uh, the, the research we had done mm -hmm. at Purdue. And uh, while I was, uh, you know, right before I left, uh, the discussion was made about my uh, coming back as the head of the school. And uh, Harold uh, Amrine decided to stay one more year and held the job while I went to Berkeley. So the arrangement was, before I left, right before I left, was that I would uh, come back as the head, back, and that was done with, uh, with uh, Dean. Uh, uh, I want to say, uh, was it Hawkins or Grosh? Uh, yes, it was Hawkins. Yes, it was Hawkins okay. who made the arrangements really before I left. Mm -hmm. Okay. I guess when I came back, though, Grosh had uh, had taken over as as dean. Okay. And uh, Hawkins had moved up to. Uh, uh, assistant vice president or vice president for academic affairs. Okay, all right. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk about talk a little about the head. Some of the things. One of the things that I read that you said that the most important job the head of a school has is faculty recruitment. So you were involved in that. <laughs> that was. I, I thought that was a, a key. Yeah, one of the most important because you hire faculty for such long term. Anyhow, you hope to hire them for long term. Sure. So you want to be very careful about who you pick. Right. <clears throat> because once they're in and then they get tenured, you know, you they're they're sort of uh, independent entities in a way. But so you want to hire very good people. And I spent a lot of time uh, working at who to hire, uh, where to recruit, and then how to choose these people. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that 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 became. And then keeping in touch with especially the new young faculty sure, uh, and helping them get situated. Yes, doing in. mentoring. Yes, indeed. And they, they need that new faculty, sure. need that kind of support when they come. All right. So that, that takes a lot of time, yeah. You did some funding and you got some NSF. Do you, you build a research program in there too, didn't the school? Well, that's right. Yeah. The, the library program was still going strong, the research program, and so with a lot of resort, uh, support from NSF. And eventually we got over a million dollars uh, over the whole hall from NSF to support library research at Purdue. Okay, very and good. So it was a pretty successful program that way. Okay. What about uh, the graduate program? Did that start taking off too, or when you were beginning? Yeah, well, actually, I guess uh, Harold had gotten it started. It was uh, it was uh, going pretty well, uh -huh. but we began to build the faculty <coughs> and uh, building up the research program, which gave us funds to support uh, hiring new people. And so, yeah, the graduate program really started to build, uh, and we. Uh, pretty well determined uh, to do it, <clears throat> you know, in, in strongly in manufacturing, strongly in operations research, in human factors, and in systems engineering. Mm -hmm. We okay. really pushed those programs uh, pretty hard. All right. Okay. Uh, then it, during, during that, or uh, before that, or uh, during that, you had that, uh, sub, this, the uh, lectureship, the Fulbright Hayes lectureship? That's and right. Uh, make a comment on that? That was well, a whole I could year. Say, yeah, that's right. So he, see, that came in 1975. Right. So uh, at the uh, <clears throat> at the end of uh, that's right. Yeah. And so it was at that time that I decided that maybe I should step down and uh, and turn this over to somebody else because I'd been in, in the in the office from well, 68 to. Uh, About 74, 75. 70, yeah, 74, 75. Uh -huh. And I decided at that time maybe. Maybe it'd be a good idea, and the dean seemed Dean Hancock was the dean at that time, and okay. he seemed to be supportive of that. So, I stepped down, and and took a sabbatical at the time, uh -huh. and I got a Fulbright Hayes, yeah, <clears throat> to to go to Yugoslavia, and uh, teach uh, in the in the mechanical engineering school actually at in in, in Ljubljana, Yugoslavia at the mm -hmm. time. And it was uh, teaching in, in operations research, but I also did some teaching in the library research thing oh, to uh, different library groups in, in, in Europe. Okay. I gave talks there. You were gone for the whole year? Was it a, uh, you took a year That's sabbatical? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the family went with you then, I guess. At that time, we had had, we, we, when we came to, to uh, Purdue, we had three children. And uh, <clears throat> well, actually, we had the fourth, the fourth, the, our, our Three girls, and then 
the fourth, the boy, was just born as we uh, came oh, okay. to, to Purdue. And then we had two more boys. So we actually had six children at the time, three girls, three boys. Wow. And all of them went off to Yugoslavia. With <laughs> Lucky <us>. for them. <laughs> it was quite a, quite a crowd. Yeah, I and, bet. Uh, you know, the kind of thing you harder to do nowadays but then you could sort of put six kids in the back of a station wagon that's and right. take off <laughs> that's right i know <laughs> oh well then after the next thing i was going to as i mentioned when we talked before the you came back as head then in 81 yeah right. that's right after i came back is uh and back into teaching and then but then you became the head in 81 huh yes it was uh i don't know uh, well i guess Let's see, that's when Wilbur Myers decided, he, no, he took my place. Uh -huh. uh, and, and then Wilbur, shortly after I came back, Wilbur decided that he was going to move on to, uh, let's see, he went to Penn State as the dean, and uh, dean of engineering, and left the job open. And I was on the search committee to search for uh, another head. And as we were going through this thing, uh, Dean Hancock said to me, look, Ferd, why don't you get off this committee? Because I think we want to talk about you as a possibility. And before I knew it, he said, hey, the committee decided you're the guy they want you're, to come back in. You're the man, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So now, that's how it got. That happened in a way. Sure. And uh, back into the job again. Okay. Uh, a couple things that uh, the, the research topic was large-scale manufacturing, but during that time, the computer integrated Design Manufacturing Automatic Center. You were the director for. Well, that's what happened. Yeah, yeah. in that in that time before uh, when I came back from uh, Yugoslavia until uh, the, the new headship thing, I became very involved uh, with a group that was. Well, what had happened was that uh, uh, it, I, the whole story, the way it happened, really was that uh, uh, President Hansen had gone off on a. Uh, a major fundraising uh, around the country, really a tour around the country, talking to corporate, especially corporate groups around uh -huh. the country. And he came back and he said, uh, I, I happened to be involved because Dean Hancock got me involved in this, but he said, uh, where, wherever I went, people said, what is Purdue going to do for us? Our manufacturing is really uh, suddenly fleeing overseas. And we don't seem to be able to compete with the with the the low wages of overseas companies. And how are we possibly going to compete in manufacturing? And so, what will Purdue do for us? Well, uh, uh, the dean said we have to figure out some answer for that because they want engineering to respond to it. And Dean Hancock held a uh, well. I, we, we, many of us got into the discussion, and at the time. It was really, uh, uh, I, I guess, was, at, 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 at the, uh, in the IE school, we were, I was already involved in this project uh -huh. working on advanced computerized manufacturing. And uh, that became the uh, possible focus of this response. So Dean Hancock held this all-engineering all uh, meeting remember we held it at Turkey Run and he invited any faculty members who were interested in the subject from all, all parts of engineering to discuss how we might respond to Dean, to President Hansen's uh, question. <laughs> and what came out of it was to really expand this whole computerized manufacturing activity on a very large all engineering scale with mechanical engineering and electrical engineering taking big parts in it with IE. So that's that was the SIDMAC program, we called it the Computer Integrated Design, Automation, and Manufacturing mm -hmm. uh, Center. And we would recruit, we would solicit a lot of support from industry uh, as well as federal support. And that's the way the program became organized. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was chairing a committee to set this up. Uh, a, a, a faculty committee when uh, Dean Hancock said, well, let's, let's set it up now. You be the director. Uh, although I think actually Dean Hancock was the nominal director and I was sort of the associate director to uh, run the program. And, uh, and we had uh, key professors from uh, 
all those fields, including uh, professors from management mm -hmm. working with us to get all of the faculty as possible involved in it. So I did that for a couple of years. We had it, got it launched and organized when this switch to taking over the headship of IE came up again. Sure. And at that time, I, I stepped out of that. It was sort of agreed I shouldn't do that along with the SIDMAC program. And so that's when Jim Solberg stepped in and really took off with the program. Mm -hmm. okay. he really, he built it enormously. Right. So that's sort of how that transition occurred uh, okay. back then. It was, uh, what, in 19, uh, late 70s, Something like early that. 80s, when right. we did this, yeah. the switcheroo. Mm -hmm. And uh, things finally settled down. I stayed with uh, the IE school, and Jim Solberg really took off with the SIDMAC right. program. Okay. The school grew, uh, there was growth during the time that you were there, and uh, about the rankings, that really uh, took, you know, center stage with U.S. News. Uh, that, was a big, that was a big thing. Yeah, they, they just started that. Uh, about the time that uh, you became the head, somewhere mm -hmm. towards the end, That's late right. 80s or 90s, yeah. Yeah, and that was, uh, that was a lot of fun when that happened, uh, because they just started that program, and I guess that was the first year really that U.S. News and World Report issued that uh, ranking, which has continued. Right. And uh, we were able to achieve a number one status in it, which That's was right. quite, exactly. a, quite, a, quite a surprise. Done, yeah. it, We've always it done really, well. <laughs> it was a wonderful thing, yes. Right. Uh, what about facilities and space? Did you make any changes along that line while you were the, during the headship? Or? Well, you know, uh, the SIDMAC, the research money that was coming in from SIDMAC was very helpful, certainly in in certainly redoing uh, Michael Golden Labs. Oh, okay. Uh, they were almost totally refurbished, especially one part of it there, the uh, the eastern part, uh, or would it be the southern? Any other part closest to Grissom uh, was uh, refurbished totally uh, for the purposes of, of the SIDMAC program, and <clears throat> that was very good. Uh, and then there was the discussions with Aero of, uh, uh, you know, swapping space with them as they were, you know, to eventually get that third floor space. But initially we were doing the uh, rearranging Grissom uh, between us. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, getting some, some laboratories built there in the first floor of, of Grissom. Right. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> One of the things that took place on your watch was the visit of uh, President Reagan. Oh, that's right. Yes, he came to see the the program, the right. SIDMAC program, and uh, visited. And uh, did you course, get? Did you enter? Did you see him when he was here? You know, I saw okay. him, but I didn't have okay. uh, any real. Uh, Jim Solberg was running the program, okay. and they and they ran it all through Jim and his uh, a few a few people in the dean's office working sure. with Jim because they wanted to keep a certain amount of keeping it hush hush exactly where he would go on campus. Yeah, right. Uh, that, there was a, it was a very tight uh, circle who knew exactly when he would be where. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> Orchestrated. Yes. <laughs> right. One thing he, came, he came down Northwestern and he went through the technology building. Right. And from there he uh, uh, got over into Michael Golden Lab. Uh -huh. <clears throat> And he never did get into Grissom or anything. He just okay. went to Michael Holden Lab, then back out. Sure. You know. That was a nice thing. Well, the uh, one I was going to ask you about the technical paper contest, that uh, you, were, you used to attend those sessions for the student chapter of IIE. Uh, remember when they used to have those? I'm, they started in about 1973. Uh -huh. And then remember the students, those that won in the region, would some of them, would, of course, would go on to the national. That's right. That's right. We would do that. You know, that's interesting. I uh, hadn't thought about that for a long while. Mm -hmm. But that was a good program. Oh, yeah, right. I think it's it was a very good program. Right. Uh, very, uh, something the students really rose to. It was very, very and the, pretty. And having been and at some of the presentations, they were well done. Yes. Right. Yes. I think that okay. was a. Well, then you decided to step down, what, in 93? And then what came next is that when then you became the director of the uh, TAP program, yeah. huh? After I down, the dean asked me to, to to move over and take on the directorship of, uh, of TAP. Yeah. I had worked with TAP. You know, TAP is a program in which faculty who are interested in that, that's the application of IE to industry, uh -huh. to Indiana industry. And I had been working as an advisor to some students who, who were, were involved in the, in the program. program. Okay. Yeah. 
And in fact, Bob Greenhorn was the director of the program then. Uh -huh. And I would be the IE faculty member, and I had some IE students working with me. And, uh, and then Bob Greenhorn went up to uh, what uh, graduate dean uh -huh. and the vice president uh, for research. And so uh, the job became open, and I took the job as director of TAP. Uh -huh. yeah, okay. At that time. All right. Um, two pro uh, for the researchers. Tell them a little about the outstanding industrial engineering awards, which have been given for some time. Uh -huh. Well, you know, I would say the outstanding that came after me. Oh, you okay. Know? Uh, okay. So it's really the the heads that followed me that that put pursued that, which I think was a very good. Pro of course, that came out of the dean's office. I think uh -huh. uh, the initial uh, push to do that, like all engineering. All the engineering schools started the outstanding right. uh, for their respective school, right? And and the idea was to uh, these would become the people who would then be selected for the distinguished engineering right. graduate award. Then you can to make a comment on that for the researchers. That's been going for a period of time. That has that that went, of course, before the OIE oh, sure, sure. award. But the idea was then, well, this would identify those people. Who might later be selected for the DEA? For the DEA, right? Yeah, okay. and it was a—it's a very good idea. I think it's, yeah. it's worked very well. Right, and of course, the winner, <laughs> one of the winners in 2006, as you recall, it was Keith Crotch, Crock, yeah. and he's the current chairman of the board ah. of trustees. Oh, that's terrific. Yes, um, let's move. On. Let's uh, talk a little about the 50th anniversary and the author of uh, being the author of the book, *An Enduring Quest: The Story of oh. Purdue Industrial Engineers*. Well, let's see about that book. Well, you know, the book originally, <coughs> the idea was to uh, th th to have the book, even hopefully have it by that 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 banquet that was held, the, the 50th celebration, the 50th anniversary of the school's naming, uh, and <coughs> the idea was to have a book. And I had worked, you know, there was a, a, a editor hired and a committee of faculty working on it, and, uh -huh. and I remember the editor, uh, uh, she had contacted me and I had given her inputs and and the book seemed to be coming along when I guess Prabhu was the chairman at the time and decided well he just wanted to didn't quite like the way it was all coming together and wanted a different take on it or something and and he he stopped by here and he was out on the west coast and he asked me to come have breakfast with him Mm -hmm. And I did, and he said, you know, Fred, I really would like you to take a crack at it, I, I, I maybe try a different approach uh, at the history. And and so I said, well, okay, I'll do that since uh, I'll try I had the time. And, I <clears throat> and so actually what I did was to take a longer view instead uh -huh. of just the 50-year view to go back to really the beginning uh, of Purdue when the beginnings of IE really started to happen. Mm -hmm. And so I really built the history from a, a different perspective that way by going back to uh, very early Purdue and looking at the origins of IE. And the thing is that I had been teaching a course, the IE 200 course, for oh, maybe 25 years. And it was an introduction to IE for sophomores. Mm -hmm. And in the time, I collected a lot of this historical material that I would try to teach to the students. And so I had a file of all this historical material, and I, <clears throat> I really drew on that mm -hmm. uh, very heavily. And so the book kind of reflects, it really is, it's the textbook I wish I had. Uh -huh. I had had back then when I was teaching that sure. course. Right, you so put it I, all together. I, I finally had a chance to put together those sure. old class notes, you know, right. in, in, a, in, in a read. And so that's really what, that's really what, to me, the book represents, okay. is that textbook I wish I had had. <laughs> and so I kind of, I sort of was writing it for the alumni, yeah. uh, you know, for saying, hey, this is, this is what I meant to tell you back then when I taught the course. This is the way it was, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. um, so it was a different take, and, it's, and it seems to have worked, uh, right. you know. Yeah, it's a nice book. Did you ever meet uh, Lillian Gilbreth? Oh, yes. Oh, did you? Oh, yes, okay. indeed. T could you just make a comment? Because, you know, we have the collection here. At Purdue, of course, you have some over in your library, in the library over there. Yeah, and she is one marvelous person, uh, uh, individual. The thing is, uh, Harold Amrine used to uh, had a standing offer to her to visit Purdue whenever she could. Uh huh. And so, 
when I first uh, came to Purdue in 1961, uh, she uh, uh, would come and stop by once or twice a year, mm -hmm. and and Harold Amron would have a, a tea, he called it, uh, <laughs> for the faculty to, to, to meet her. Uh -huh. And sometimes she would give talks, often she would want to give a talk. Uh -huh. so, I remember meeting her in uh, in one of those early talks, and then when I when I uh, so it must have been I don't know just what year it must have been in the early '60s when uh, she came, mm -hmm. and I remember uh, I remember two big things about that first time I met her. One is I remember having well separately I I, I had a chat with her at this tea, and I remember asking her about her her children, uh -huh. and then her grandchildren, and then her great-grandchildren. Hmm. And <clears throat> she told me that she tried to send a gift, a birthday gift, to every one of those children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. And I was mentally figuring out that she was sending a gift about every three days. <laughs> right, I think so. Right. <laughs> I thought, fantastic, you know. <laughs> a lot it's of good shopping. if you can do it. <laughs> and then, yeah. And, I was thinking, and she, she tried to write a, a personal letter to him. And I thought, my gosh, what a busy woman, you know, just keeping in touch with all these offspring. Sure, right. <laughs> and she, uh, Did you ever meet Ernestine? Uh, yes, indeed. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, several times, because then after, you know, after the 70s, she really couldn't travel that much. Sure. And uh, didn't come anymore. And so, uh, but you know, another thing about her visit, that last visit, was <clears throat> she said she wanted to talk to the seniors. And... Uh, so Harold and Ryan arranged for her to take over one of the senior classes uh, <clears throat> and give a talk. And I was so curious as to what could this 75-year-old woman uh, tell seniors mm -hmm. you know, and hold their attention. So I went and sat in the back of the room uh -huh. to hear, how did she do this and what did she do? And I was so stunned. She, her, her big message was, she told them she had just returned from India. and. Uh, he wanted to give them one strong message was to travel around the world, to go to foreign countries whenever the opportunity presented itself. Wow. And then she said, and I don't want you to, to go to think that you're going to be the great savior and help them. I want you to go and learn from them. And she said, you will, you will see sights you have never seen before. You will smell smells. You will see colors. You will hear talk and languages. And she said, it'll just open you up. And she just went on about this, of how valuable that was, sure, just to sure. open yourself up to these world experiences. <laughs> and it was quite an interesting, and she really had them all listening very carefully. She was very, a very effective speaker. Yeah, I'm sure she did. <laughs> yeah, she was an amazing person. Yeah. But then you interact, you met Ernestine when she would yes, come. Yes, Ernestine uh, came, you know, Ernestine was the custodian, really the official of, of the archives. Right, uh, the collection and, of things. Yeah, yeah, so she would come at least once a year to sign a, converse with the library about what was going on and mm -hmm. make arrangements and things. And so I would often, I would see Ernestine at that time. And, and one time when she came, we arranged to have a celebration of uh, a sort of in honor of, uh, of Lillian. And we, I remember we, we, we showed the movie cheaper by the dozen, uh -huh. <laughs> and, and we had uh, Ernestine talk and had several professors, uh, well, let's see, uh, who, who knew, who, had, who also had met uh, Lillian uh -huh. when she was at Purdue, and so it was a very interesting kind of a talk, uh, a, a meeting, really, of several people talking about their personal experiences of interacting with Lillian, and... Uh, I remember Ernestine uh, talking about the several moments that stood out in her mind, mostly about her mother. Uh -huh. And she said uh, one of them was when her father died. And she remembers it very clearly because her father died. She was getting ready for a graduation party herself. Ernestine. From high school, Ernestine. Yeah. Right. When, when word came that her father had died at that phone booth and uh, and she remembers so vividly the, the policeman coming to give the message to her mother. Mm. And then her mother's strong reaction to it, taking charge of the family and 
getting everything sort of under control and organized mm -hmm. uh, in the family. Hmm. And she remembered another one that stuck out in her memory. She said it was the last public appearance of her mother when she got a doctor's, uh, a doctor's degree from Arizona State. Okay. And uh, she remembers this parade around the, the stadium of uh, the, the parade of all the robed faculty and honorees. And there comes her, this little old lady, <laughs> walking at the end of the parade, which was her mother. Oh. <laughs> well, that was kind of a nice, a nice reminiscence. Her last of many honorary doctors. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, how about some awards and honors? You're a fellow of the uh, Institute of Industrial Engineers. Yes, that's and, right. And um, any other <coughs> comments on, on awards that you'd like to make a comment on? Well, let's see. That, that was quite a... That's nice. An honor I liked very much. Mm -hmm. I uh, thought the... Uh, <coughs> I, I'm just trying to think of. Uh, uh, okay. And of course, you me you're a member of the IAE and also yes, the I Operations yeah. Re Research Society too. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? That's right. Tau yeah, Beta Orsa. Pi. Yes, I was. <coughs> uh, and uh, and of course, Tau Beta Pi, the honorary right. uh, doctor uh, engineering society, and right. Alpha Pi Mu, which was the honorary for for Jesuit schools, uh, uh, and then Alpha Pi. I mean, Alpha Sigma Nu was that. And Alpha Pi Mu is the one for. Uh, uh, I.E. Oh, right, IE exactly. Society, right. Yeah. How about so, fam uh, <clears throat> your family? Where the the children are? Did some of them come to Purdue? Oh yes, I guess really. I'm trying to think. I think they must have all studied there in some way. I guess except for the oldest girl. Uh huh. Uh, but my uh, my daughters uh, and all three sons have degrees from Purdue. Yes. Okay. Okay. So five of them do. Plus, my wife got a master's degree. Very good. Uh, later on at, at Purdue, so there's six members of the family with degrees from Purdue. Sounds good. <laughs> yeah. um, how about a Purdue tradition? Does one? Do you have a Purdue tradition that you want to comment on? And it comes uh, to mind. Oh my! What should it be? <clears throat> we of course all all the family have a great affection for Purdue. In fact, sure. uh, my 80th birthday we celebrated this year. And uh, one of the gifts I got, uh, the family, we had a family reunion <coughs> for, uh, to celebrate the birthday. I was, uh, they, they played the Purdue fight song, and they gave me a Purdue band hat. <laughs> oh, wear. great. So I had with a big plume, you know, <laughs> uh, the white, <laughs> the white hat, peaked hat. And that was one of my main gifts at the birthday. Super. Was, uh, they Super. wanted me to sit and pose. <laughs> 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 that's the sort of thing that goes on in the family. That was just a couple of months, you know, six yeah, months ago right. we had that celebration. And no, that's always been fun. <clears throat> My wife, Natalie, has always said her her secret ambition was to be a, a golden girl or silver twin or something. She just always thought that was great. So yeah. she would you know, <laughs> take the kids over and watch the band practices. And that was kind of fun. Yeah. yeah. That was a big How about, part uh, of the yeah, how about outstanding event? Do you have an outstanding event? I'm sure you have more than one, but oh you can have my. a couple. That comes oh to mind. Wow. <clears throat> what would be outstanding events? Well, of course, I think uh, recently, as I think, uh, you know, I was very impressed just even last year when I, I came back to Purdue and there were two celebrations of, uh, of one was of, of alumni, mm -hmm. the OIE event, and then there was one celebrating sort of uh, alumni faculty. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thing I liked about that is it, it seemed like such a strong tradition continuing. Right. And after writing the book and thinking back a hundred years, I thought, wow, it continues. You know, that strength of uh, that, that solid uh, feeling about Purdue as an educational institution with some very, uh, very wonderful people right. involved in it. Right. And that, yeah. that, that, uh, that continues to be, you know, my my great feelings about Purdue is the personal uh, commitment of the people at Purdue uh, to education, and it's uh, it's quite a quite a strong thing. Yes, <coughs> very very nicely said. How about some in closing? I'm going to leave it up to you for do you any reflections and or something that I didn't ask that you want to comment Gee, on. We, we we covered a lot of ground there, uh -huh. and uh, in a short time, I'm I'm uh, impressed. 
I'm trying to think. Uh, <clears throat> what, what can I say? Well, Are certainly you? I should comment on some of the people I, I worked okay. with. And, and, you know, Jim Barney was one of them. Uh, Jim and I, have, we had such a close relationship. You know, when I first came to Purdue and was assigned uh, an office, it was a, a, a classroom that was converted into two offices. Oh, okay. And, and Jim was on the other side and I was on that side. And we just had it separate. We separated our spaces with bookcases. <laughs> we could look at each That's other. That's a room you know, divider, right? A, yeah, it was quite a <laughs> shared space. So Jim and I started out that way, you know, as the two young guys on the faculty. Uh -huh. And uh, <clears throat> so Jim was a great, a great person to introducing me to the Indiana tradition, to the Purdue tradition. Uh, he was so filled with it uh, that, and then when I came back from uh, Berkeley and took over his head, uh, my first action was to make Jim the associate head, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because I just started, I couldn't run this without Jim, and, uh, and of course he just, we divided it up very neatly. He took over all student uh, affairs, mm -hmm. and I took the faculty affairs, so I dealt with the faculty and he dealt with the students, uh -huh. and that's the way we divided it up. If it was if it was a student event or a student issue, uh, I always said, uh, "Go see Jim first. I'll, I'll act as an appeal to it. If uh, you don't like what Jim decides or does, okay, you can come see me. But uh, go see Jim." But, uh -huh. And that was for any student, act, you know, all the way through uh, undergraduate through graduate. Sure. <clears throat> and of course, the guy worked himself to death. As we used to kid about the fact that he was handling something like contacts with 500, 600 people, and I was dealing it with maybe as many as 30, you know, so we kind of had an unequal distribution <laughs> of people there, <laughs> the headaches were kind of equal, I think, we, we shared it anyhow, and it worked, it worked beautifully for many, many years, mm -hmm. and of course, uh, Jim is, well, he went lower than I did at it, <laughs> so, fantastic guy. All right. Any other come? Uh, any other, of course, uh, Moshe Barash. Well, Moshe sure, Barash. yeah. The key, right. some of the key people on the faculty. Right. Uh, I hate to single anyone's out, but no. Moshe was very important because he was my guru. He was the wise old man, <clears throat> and he would come into my office uh, maybe once a day or at least several times a week, and would just sit down and he would just talk to me about what was going on, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and in this wise way that I have to stop everything and we would have this chat about uh, <clears throat> the world and what was going on and how Purdue was sitting and how the program was going. And <clears throat> it was a very, a very helpful kind of a thing. It was yeah. kind of like taking you out of everything to sort of step aside and let's look at this. In let's a take a look way. at it, right? Yeah. yeah exactly. And, and so Moshe did that and we had that relationship went on for years. So again, another person who was extremely uh, valuable uh, in my way, anyhow, and of course, it really came together with that with that uh, advanced manufacturing program. Yes, I was going to say because he's involved in that it too. Was his ideas that really sparked right. that whole thing. All right, All right. But there were other very important faculty members. In fact, so many of the faculty members were people I really cherished as colleagues. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's hard to single out. No. <laughs> you had a good working re race relationship with all of them, right? That's what, see, I took that to be, the, I was sort of that, that glue. <laughs> because faculty are, tend to be prima donnas. <laughs> they tend to be people who are kind of wrapped up in their own work. They don't often socialize very well with their colleagues. Uh, and so my connect, my job was always to sort of keep them connected. Right. Uh, I felt I felt I had to talk to every faculty member at least once a month for a, an hour sure. just to find out what was going on, and make sure I I knew everything that was going on. That's right. And and so that that was a lot of my time, but I just felt that was very important to yeah. keep right. touch with what these guys they they never a faculty member don't like to have their problems delegated to somebody else. They, That's right. They want it handled, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But now, anyhow, it, yeah. it worked that way. One final thing I was going to ask you for, what are you doing in your retirement? In addition to the book, are you doing anything special now? or? Well, yeah, actually, okay. to, to move out here to California was, was difficult in one respect. Housing out here is outrageously expensive. Ooh. So 
the same kind of house you could buy in Lafayette is three times as expensive out here. Ooh. I found that unbelievable when I came. And so, it, you know, it took us two years to find a house we could afford. Sure. And that house was a fixer-upper. <clears throat> so I ended up being a general contractor. <laughs> uh, and That's I all right. had to, you know, and so I, I kept that now. Then I stopped all that to write the book. The book took about two years of solid oh, yeah. time. Right. But now my son just bought a fixer-upper here. And so I find myself suddenly back at work as a contractor again. <laughs> <you know? laughs> so we're, that's okay. That we're keeps you going away. So it's keeping me busy. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and I like that. Sure. And are you going to plan? Will you be coming back? Uh, are your plans to come back to to uh, well, visit at any time? Well, when I can, I do have two children living in Indiana, mm -hmm. in Indianapolis and Bloomington, sure. two daughters, and. So I'm thinking when I come back, and well, I see them certainly once a year or more. Right. And uh, at that time, scoot up to Lafayette and say hi to people at Purdue. Right. We l we would like that very much. I'm okay. certainly looking forward to when they get a new head uh, <laughs> at, at, in the school. You know, I sure. I think Joe is doing a, a outstanding job. Uh, I wish he would take the job, but I guess uh, they want to look for somebody else anyhow. Yeah. Well, we're I keeping our hope. fingers crossed anyway. Yes, I do hope they find a super right. guy to do it. Yeah. Fred, I want to thank you very much for okay. everything. And uh, my best to, I'm going to log off, but I have, don't hang up. I will make a comment.